that's above all names, our Lord Jesus Christ. We come before you, Lord. We lift up Jesus. And we acknowledge your redemption, your salvation, your heart's desire, Lord, towards mankind. We acknowledge, Lord, your people, the body, the church, represented here today. We're asking, Lord, that we might be lifted into your purpose, into that place where you would have us, that we might come up, Lord, into the heavens, that we might hear a word from the throne. We ask, Lord, that we might be given direction and purpose for our lives, that we might hear a word from heaven. Quicken us. Grant us, Lord, a, a hearing ear, a receptivity of spirit. And I would ask, Lord, a prophetic tongue that your word, quickened, anointed, imparted, will come forth to the accomplishing of your will. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory. Amen. Glory. Hallelujah. I was privileged back in the 1950s to have three spiritual fathers. Each one was very different. There was Walter Butler. You know, probably know the name because his notes are available. But Walter Butler had a unique walk with the Lord. He had a ministry that was probably 95% Overseas, He traveled extensively, but always led by the Spirit. He had a unique ability to walk in the Spirit. And I was privileged to sit under his ministry, and we would be in the classroom. And all at once, there'd be a touch of the presence of the Lord, and he would stop. Spoke with a fairly heavy German accent. He would stop. And he'd say, Lord, you're here. Lord, we just want to let you know that we know that you're here. And Lord, we like it. And then he'd wait a minute, then he'd start. Within a few minutes, that room would be engulfed with the presence of the Lord and the Spirit would begin to move. And that would happen again and again. But his life was committed to cultivating the presence of the Lord, a receptivity, an ability to hear. It tremendously impacted, affected my life. There was Ivan Spencer. And Ivan Spencer had a visitation, I would say a major visitation from the Lord concerning the end time. And there was imparted into his being a sense of the last days that there was a calling on his life to prepare a people for the purposes of the Lord for the end time. And that visitation came in 1924 while he was walking in a snowstorm. And I happened to be born in 1924. So two things happened that year. <laughs> so... But he had a sense of the redemption of the body, and we were praying one time for him. And a very clear word came from the Lord that he would not see that which he was hoping for, the redemption, the present living redemption of his body on this side of the grave, that he would not see it, but his children would. And I believe I'm one of those children. And the Lord is saying much today about the redemption of the body for those that have an ear to hear. There's a lot being said. We're living in that time frame. 
If you're listening, you're going to hear something about the redemption of the body, longevity of life. There was an impartation of my, into my life concerning the last days, the end time. And then there was John Wright Follett. I met him in a very unusual way. In fact, I was sent to his room to fix an outlet. And when he opened the door, he looked and he said, oh, there you are. Gave me a big hug as if, he'd, as if he was waiting for me or knew who I was. And something clicked. And he became a father, and I was able to visit his home. And I've often said this to people. If you had been able to go into his home and spend three days, if he never said a word to you, you would have come out absolutely changed and transformed with a hunger and desire for the Lord such as you never had before because he lived it. I was there one time, and... He was setting the table, and I noticed that he always set three place settings. And I said, Brother John, is someone else coming? And he said, no. He said, I, he never married. He's single all his life. And he said, I always set two places, one for me, one for the Lord. And I, in, I welcome the Lord. I invite him to sit with me, and I converse with him while I'm eating. <laughs> we have fellowship at the table. You see, he lived it. He was speaking one time. I saw this with my physical eyes. The anointing came so heavy upon him, he forgot where he was and stopped speaking. And he's standing there talking like, first, like talking to God, conversationally. Then all at once he realized, he says, where am I? And looked around, and then he apologized to the people and started speaking again. But that was his life. There was a major impartation. He had an inner life, John Follett, an inner life of the Spirit, a relationship. Walter Butler was led, guidance, the manifest presence of the Lord. Ivan Spencer, vision, purpose, the end time, preparation of a people. You see, each one had a part, and each made up part of the whole. And I can remember years ago that I was engulfing myself in their message and speaking what I, what, what I had received, and the Lord stopped me and cut me off from the ministries that they had. And I knew that those things had to become personalized. In fact, the Secret of the Stairs book, when that vision came, I was alone praying, and I was, as it were, translated into the Song of Solomon. I became the Song of Solomon. And I felt, I, I became each person within the Song of Solomon. I experienced and felt what they felt. And the book came out of that experience. And when I finished, I said, now I've got something to speak. And the Lord rebuked me, and he said, you're not to speak it, you're to live it. And then you're to minister the result of, of how that has affected your life. You see, ministry is, Paul said, the ministry works, works life in you but death in me. One who is truly walking with the Lord feeds on the Lord and then others feed on that person. And it takes the life right out of you. But it's the substance of God that's imparted through your life. Glory, hallelujah. We're living in a very unique time. You won't need to turn to this, but there's a verse. I've used it here many times. It's in Genesis concerning Adam and Eve after the transgression. The word is this. They heard the voice of the Lord walking in the garden. Not while they were walking in the garden they heard the voice, but they heard the voice walking. That is absolute. Only God could say that, and that is profound. That tells us two things. They heard the voice walking. And the voices don't walk, but this one did. Because there's a reason. See, God has something to say. He desires to communicate. But he's walking. That means what he said yesterday is not sufficient for today. There's a fresh word, a fresh revelation. There's something that goes beyond. <clears throat> 
And I received from John Follett, Walter Butler, Ivan Spencer. But I had to go beyond. That had to come in to my being, be assimilated. I gained. They spent a lifetime, and I received an impartation. But then it had to go further because the Lord is what? He's walking. There's a fresh word. Much of my praying has to do with a fresh word from the Lord. Lord, what are you saying? What's the word for today? And I pray that. Now, I want to be real careful how I say this because I'm not talking about me. But I don't know how else to say it. But I, I, I'm not talking about myself. But I traveled. I got in, I think, about 75,000 air miles last year in ministry. I'm not going to do that again. But I did it. And all over the country. And everywhere I would go, I'm hearing something. People come to me. It's happened in the Northwest, in Southern California, in Texas, and wherever I've been. <clears throat> People come to me. They say, the Lord is speaking things to us, is telling us things. And we're going from church to church to church, trying to get a confirmation and we're not hearing. And we were beginning to wonder if there was something wrong with us. I could, this is almost like, like, I mean, I've heard this dozens of times all over the country. We've gone from church to church to church. And we, we were beginning to wonder if something's wrong with us. And we come to your meeting and we hear the same thing that the Lord is speaking to us. Now that puts that scares me because that puts a responsibility. But also it's a confirmation because I'm asking the Lord for what? A present word. See, a present word. Not what was for yesterday, not the message of yesterday, the good old days. But a present word because the Lord is walking. He's going further. He's moving on. So there's a fresh word. And we are in a time of transition, of major transition. And right there, uh, I'll, I'll be back. This is the first time I've been at Pinecrest since last June. But I'll be back now probably fairly often. So, <laughs> I don't know. But, um, so I'm not going to get said everything but that I'm feeling. We're living in a time of transition. The church relates to grace. Salvation. The message of the church is to whomsoever will. The goal of the church is heaven. The goal, heaven. Be absent from the body, to be present. The kingdom is quite different. The church, grace. The kingdom, government. You see, the kingdom is the government of God. Grace, the time of grace, is a time of preparation when the Lord is gathering a people to himself in different layers, different levels. And we determine that level, that layer of, of commitment that we're willing to make. The kingdom relates to government. The message is not to whomsoever will. The message of the kingdom is to him who overcomes will I grant to sit with me where? On my throne. That's government, the throne. To him who overcomes will I grant. To... The goal of the church is heaven. The goal of the kingdom is what? The throne, government. It's, quite, it's a different message. The message of the church relates to Jesus within, becoming a habitation of God. In the kingdom, Jesus comes upon. The government is on what? The shoulders. But he's what? He's the head, so he's taking his headship. There's two Greek words, primary words, for the return of the Lord. One, and I'm not saying them right, because I really don't know Greek. But it's erikomai and parousia. Erikomai, if I pinch you, you'll holler out. You know, I, you're, you're here. 
But parousia is more is here, but it's more than that. It's the presence that precedes. See, it's a presence. It's the presencing of the Lord. We're in the time of the parousia, the increase of the presence of the Lord. He's beginning to come, but he's taking his place as the head of the body. And before the world ever sees, he sees the Lord, he's going to reveal himself to the body. And the world's going to see Jesus through the body. The world considers the church to be something like a mosquito bite. You know, it's an, it itches a little bit and it's a nuisance, but it'll go away. But they're in for a rude awakening. Just as Moses attempted to deliver his brethren and fled before his brethren and Pharaoh, he returned, he stood before a bush that burned with fire, parousia, the presencing of the Lord, direct intervention, and he went back empowered. And this time, the Lord's people were brought out, and it was Pharaoh that trembled. And the world will yet tremble before the church. Glory. It's going to happen. We're in a time of preparation. The Lord is preparing a people through whom he's going to reveal his power and his glory. But he's very fussy. He'll give gifts and ministries, but he will not share his power and their glory. Whom the Lord loves, he chastens. Every son that he receives, he scourges. Chastening means I've done something wrong. I'm being corrected, and I thank the Lord for that. Whom the Lord loves, I ask the Lord to chasten me. I actually pray, Lord, please chasten me. Whom the Lord, what? Loves. Best way to find out if you're loved or not. <laughs> but every son, that, that not a baby, a mature son, every son he receives, he scourges. That's vicious. Scourging is the most vicious thing that one human can do to another. And that word is there. Why? Because the self-will has to be, the self-will, the independence within us, the independent spirit, we have to become a part of a corporate expression, the end time, a corporate body in harmony, unity, and it requires that. Acts 1.8 is very much an end time verse. It relates to the end time, but ye shall receive power after, not when, after. If you have a King James, it says after. If anything else, it says when. It's never when, it's always after. You receive power after. You submit to the dealings, the disciplining, the testings, the proving. After you spend time waiting in the presence of the Lord, after you have an experience with the Lord, you receive power. It's never when. And ye shall be witnesses. You all know this, the Greek word for witness. Martyr, thank you. It is martyr. See, because he's the, when, when, when the church is revealed, there's, it's not going to be a two-headed monster. My head and the Lord's competing for control. It's going to be one head. I'm crucified. I'm dead. My head's gone. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. Because, you see, this is end time. He, the Lord taking his headship, his place. He's taking his head now. He's beginning to exercise dominion authority for the kingdom. His first righteousness will come to this in a little bit. Peace and then joy. And the kingdom is first established within and then it begins to reach out. It has to do with government. My life submitted to the government of God. And I learned this through these three men that were unique, that influenced my life. Each one of them under totally different, a different message, Totally different personalities, makeups, diverse in their ways, their ministries, but each one totally controlled, fully controlled and under the, the, the authority and the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there was a witness, a powerful witness through each of their lives. In past transitions, I think I mentioned this Friday, Noah, Abraham, Moses, 
John the Baptist, pre the preparation, Jesus in his first coming. There was intense times of divine activity. Now we're in a time of transition, major. Now we're, we're going to look at a verse if you want to. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I stand at the door. A door is a place that goes from one place, of course, into a new, another. And each one of us has a room, a spiritual room that we live in. We become very comfortable with the furniture of that room, the way we meet the Lord, the way the Lord responds, how we live our lives both spiritually and 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 the outworking of our lives in this world. There, 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 there's furniture that we understand, that we relate to. But the Lord desires to take us higher into something different. And the treasures are in darkness. We don't fully understand. We have to move in by faith that is in darkness. And then it begins to unfold. And because we're so comfortable with the past, There are many that will not transition from the church age into the kingdom because, see, the message, the workings, the dealings are quite different. The message of the church age is absolutely valid. Burden for souls, salvation, redemption, the preparation of lives, the disciplining, deliverance, all these things. But we're living in a time now when the Lord's beginning to is, is beginning to prepare, or not beginning, but beginning to manifest a people in, in authority that will bring a judgment on this world. We're in that time frame, see, transition, the message of the kingdom. They're both valid. But the voice of the Lord, is he's doing what? Walk. He's walking. See, there, there, there's a going further. Now, this door... I stand at the door. This is at the end of the message to the seven churches, which means that we're at the end of the church age because the door's closed. See, the message to the church at Ephesus went to, went in, led into Smyrna, Smyrna to Pergamos, then to Thyatira, then to Sardis, then to Philadelphia and Laodicea. You see, each church age led into the next one. These span the 2,000 years of church history. But here the door is closed, and the Lord is standing there knocking. That's parousia, the Lord presencing, the availability of the Lord. He's knocking. He's available. I will come in and sup with you. Therefore, the message of the kingdom is unique in that it relates to the individual, very specifically to the individual. If anyone, any person hears Many are called, but few are chosen. Better way to say it, many are called, but few will pay the price in order to qualify. There is a price. Salvation's a free gift. I'm cleansed, I'm forgiven through the blood of Jesus, but there's something beyond that. Then there's a responsibility now to, for my life to be cleansed, purified, prepared, and made ready to become that habitation that I can become the expression of the Lord. Just as a young maiden named Mary gave birth to a baby named Jesus, became available, there's a corporate womb today. Jesus came into this world as a baby. He grew in wisdom and stature. He learned obedience through the things that he suffered. He became the author of salvation. He qualified in life's arena. Through all that he went through, he submitted himself to the whip, the scourge, to the cross. But when he comes back, we have a different description. We'll just take a look at it. It's Revelation chapter 1. The Jesus that's coming back is not the picture that we have. You know, there's something interesting. If you, if you watch anything to do with Roman Catholicism, you see an adult Mary, mother, with a baby, or you see a dead Jesus on the cross, either dead or a baby. 
Never a resurrected, a living Jesus, but always a baby or a dead Jesus. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14. Well, wait, let me back up, verse 12. I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. Being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. That's the church, the church age, all that pertains to redemption. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, one likened to the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot. Now, I've said this in churches and gotten frowned at, but that's all right, because I don't mind. See, he's in the midst of the church. He's got a garment from his what? His neck to his feet. That is, the church, he's in the midst, but see, he's the head, the church is the body, but there's a garment that's covered. The body's covered. See, the world does not realize or recognize what's going on. They don't realize nor recognize what's about to happen. The Lord's not going to sneak the church out of here. He's going to empower the church to confront the world that's persecuted the church for 2,000 years. But the church today is covered from the neck to the feet. Now, a statement. See, the body's covered. Therefore, what the Lord is doing within the church, within our lives, is more important than what we're doing out there. A lot of people don't like that statement, but it's a very true one. See, what we're becoming is more important than what we're doing, because what we're doing is a product of what we are. You can't give what you don't have. Amen. Now, verse 14, his head, his hair were white like wool. That's full maturity. Not a little baby being born out of a young maiden. Now, a fully mature Jesus is about to be birthed into this world. His head, his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes as a flame of fire, his feet, that his eyes a flame of fire. See, maturity, his eyes a flame of fire. He's the head of the body. That's discernment. I want to say, because I may forget this, it's tremendously important. I will put a primary emphasis on it, that we become prophetic. I don't mean that we prophesy necessarily, that we become prophetic. By being prophetic, we become sensitive to the kingdom of God, to the purpose, the will, the presence of God, the anointing, the enabling, the presencing. See, we become sensitive to, 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 to spirituals, to the living word, the quickened word. We, we, we begin to hear by revelation what the Lord is speaking because we're prophetic, we're available. It has nothing to do with prophesying. It has to do with a sensitivity of being that's cultivated. It has to be cultivated and developed, and you've got to go after it. Covet earnestly the best gift. If you want to have a gift of healing, go after it, and you'll get it. He says, covet earnestly. Go after it. The presence of the Lord, if you want to be sensitive to the voice of the Lord, go after it. Covet earnestly. Intensely desire. Go after it. His eyes is a flame of fire. That's discernment. You're going to begin to see, to understand things. You're, you're, you're going to penetrate the surface into the real thing that's behind the surface. His feet like into fine brass as they burned in a furnace. That's the dealing of God. The workings, the preparation. The feet move the body. And there are people that have been prepared, disciplined, trained by the Lord that, that's going to move the purpose of the Lord in the earth in this day. Feet that have been formed in fire that burns away the dross, the hay, the wood, the stubble. His voice is the sound of what? Many waters. That's a corporate voice speaking, all saying the same thing in unity. See, like, it's like a mighty Niagara. That's the power of God released through the body in this day. It's a powerful thing. And the Lord is forming a corporate womb that's going to, that's going to birth the Lord into the affairs of mankind in this day. 
just as Mary birthed Jesus into the world of that day. There's a corporate womb being formed today that will birth the Lord. The sound of many waters, that corporate Jesus. The works that I do, you will do also. Why? Because he's taking his headship. In each time of intervention, there was tremendous divine activity. In this time of intervention, there will be tremendous activity, but no more Benny Hinn's, Catherine Kuhlman's, Oil Roberts. The Lord dealt with me to say this, and I decided I wasn't going to say it, and I got rebuked by the Lord and dealt with, and the Lord gave me a, a scripture reference. I didn't know what it was. I looked it up, and it said something like this. Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. And this is the statement. The greatest healing movement this world has ever seen is about to begin to be released. But it's coming through common, simple, everyday people. Not the pulpit. See, the, the body, the head of the Lord is being joined, not to the pulpit. That's the church age. Everything relates around the pulpit. But the anointing is moving from the pulpit into the body. The head's going to be joined on the body. And it's very simple, everyday people that are going to begin to be moved upon, empowered. People that are being re prepared. That's why people are coming to me and saying, the Lord is telling us things. And we're trying to find confirmation. And what they're hearing is what I'm saying right now. The Lord's preparing a people that he can trust. The temptation, I pray for a couple people and they get healed. I'll buy a big tent, rent a big stadium and start having a campaign. And thousands of people come and watch how well I perform. That's kind of nasty, but that's, I did that on purpose. Because that day's over. It's going to become a very common thing. And it's going to move through the body. And you, won't be, you don't need to be seen or recognized. You don't need a business card that says bishop or apostle so-and-so or something. Just, just ordinary people empowered by the head, moving. The world's going to see something they've never seen. His voice is the sound of many waters, the transition. Now, back to Revelation 3. I stand at the door and knock. Chapter 4. After this, I watched. I looked. Why did he look? Because he heard something. I looked, and a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard. Why? See the cultivation. This is in the heaven. Now, this is the heavenly voice. Was as, was, as it were, of a trumpet talking to me. A trumpet is a call to action. It gives direction and purpose. But it's a heavenly trumpet, not an earthly one. Therefore, there has to be that cultivated ear. You've got to spend time. They that wait upon the Lord. He shall receive power when? After. If you're wise, you'll invest heavily in eternal things. The voice of a trumpet talking with me, which said, what? Come up. That's why I said, see, this is a present word, come up. We're being called now into a higher realm, into this realm of spirituals. The church age, we're at an end. There's a, there's a new message, a new purpose. A people being prepared now for the direct intervention of the Lord, where he's going to begin to take his place, his head, manifestly. Come up. And I will show you things which must be hereafter. I've been praying this for at least three years. Very specifically, Lord, you said in your word, you will show me things which will be hereafter. Lord, I'm asking. You said you'll show me things. Not is there an antichrist or isn't there, is there a rapture, isn't there, is, and you know, is there a tribulation, none of, none of that. That, that's not what this is about. This is about the parousia, the presencing of the Lord, the preparation of a people, the functioning of the throne. See, it has to do with the throne of God functioning, not the negative, all the negative that we want to escape from and wonder about.
but the positive, see, not the, the negative that people are so concerned about, but rather the throne of God and his purpose, his function, that we become a part of that, that our interest is not escaping the negative, but becoming a part of that which is positive and creative, the power of God moving within a people that are prepared and ready and that will give the glory to the Lord. Come up, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit. See, we're not quite ready for that. That means there's been an intense preparation. And behold, a throne. The church, grace. The kingdom, what? A throne, government. <clears throat> to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. That's not everyone. Overcoming is not that I've done some great thing. Overcoming simply means that I, in my will, and heart have put the Lord first. I may fail, I'll be chastened and corrected, and I probably learn more through what I've done wrong than what I've done right. Because all things work together for good to them that are the called, that have committed their lives to the Lord. So it's not that I've done some great deeds or things, it's that my heart is in a right relationship, my life is committed. I can remember John Follett praying something like this. Lord, I mean, I heard this. I'm just, this is a direct quote from what I heard. Lord, I'm asking your very best, whatever that means, wherever it leads. I'm asking your very best. And Lord, when I object or protest, don't pay any attention. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You see, that's overcoming. Because we're going to. We're, we are going to struggle. But birthing is a struggle. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne. Now round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Round about were four and twenty seats. Verse 6, this is Revelation chapter 4. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. In the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Now Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. They sang a new song. I'd like to take a whole chapel on this sometime. Just on this, a new song, what that means. I have a song, see, because the Lord is, has given me something. Deep, a verse I love, deep calleth the deep. If you have a King James, it says at the noise of your water spouts. If you have something else, it says at the sound of your waterfalls. That ruins it. The dealings of God, the workings of the Lord in the beginning are like noise because we don't understand. It's like static, and, and it interferes with the carnal, the earthly. I mean, drastically interferes, but it's like static. It's noise. We don't really understand. We submit begrudgingly, half-heartedly. But see, if we'll stick with it, that noise will become what? A song. See, it'll become a song. The water spout means intervention, activity, divine activity. Singularly, the Lord working, moving in our lives profoundly. The water spout. They sang a new song, and I have a song. I mentioned it to somebody the other, the other, other evening when I came here. When I first came to Pinecrest, I had a one year, these buildings had been vacant for six years. I had a one year lease, one year lease. The buildings were stripped and empty. I was here, I had not one penny in this world. I had no resources, no money, but I was the weekend pastor at a little church just outside of Binghamton, New York. I had to drive 120 miles down and 120 miles back to here, and my pay was $25 a week. I had to buy gas to go down and back and support a family, 
and try to start a ministry here, a one-year lease with three empty buildings and $25 a week income. And that became what you see today. I've got a song, see? Glory. Mm. See? See, I've got, there's a, a life, a history, sacrifice, obedience, blessings. You see, there's something involved in all that. See, that became this from absolutely nothing. Now I'm starting all over again. Got a little apartment in Washington, D.C. And the Lord is saying something very special to me. He's saying this, that all that, all of this that's here, was preparation for what's going to happen that's ahead. There's some tremendous things beginning to happen in Washington, D.C. that's going to happen. And I am affecting the nation in Washington, D.C. Hmm. See, so, and see, there, there, a life that's... At one time, I owned a TV cable system. I would have been a millionaire today several times over if I'd stayed there. People told me I was out of my mind when I sold it. But I sold it, walked out into nothing. And I wouldn't trade. I had no idea what was going to happen because I felt like everything that was worth doing was already being done. And if there was anything left to be done, there were thousands of people that were 10,000 times more qualified than I was to do it. And I walked out into nothing. And I look at all this. And I said, see, I got a song. They sang a new song. And you have no idea what will happen when you commit your life. See, the Lord's going to move mightily throughout the earth to a people that have submitted, given themselves, like Mary of old, become a womb to birth the purpose of the Lord. There's a womb today, a corporate womb. You can be a part of that to birth the purpose of the Lord in the earth glory in our day you have no idea what's what what will happen thou hath redeemed us to God by thy blood our every kindred tongue people and nation that's the corporate body and hath made us now this is 24 elders and four living creatures I was privileged one if you have a King James that says us if you have another tra translation, what does it say? And hath made, verse 10, and hath made them. Because there's four living, see, that's the human mind coming in. Because four living creatures, 24 elders. So, but I was, I was in Boston a good many years ago, and I was privileged to talk to a man that I was told was the leading scholar in the world on biblical text. And I said, Revelation, chapter 5, 9 and 10, us or them? And he said, us is the better translation, is the right translation. Twenty-four elders. There were twelve patriarchs, twelve tribes, twelve apostles, the foundation of the, of, 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 of the church. The four living creatures. And I'm not going to get into this today because we take a whole chapel. And I'll try to start here another time. The face of a lion, a calf, a man, an eagle. These four living creatures, you see. It's the four sides of spiritual maturity. You've all heard of the four square church. It's the four sides. The lion, authority. The calf, submission. There's, there's more devastated Christians in this world than you can imagine. I run into them all the time. They're absolutely devastated by... By, by ministers exercising authority that have never been broken, that have no brokenness. Authority is only effective in the Lord when we've been dealt with and broken. The calf, submission, helplessness. It's the two sides of the same coin. Authority, but brokenness. Not vindictive authority. Defending a position, a title in the pulpit. The lion, authority, the calf, submission, the man, relationship, fellowship, the eagle, spirituality. The four sides of maturity. But these are in the midst of the throne, and there's a sea of glass. 
Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. I was privileged once to stand before the Lord, before his throne. The sea of glass, transparent. There's something where everything becomes transparent. And what I felt, what I saw, there is no language, no words. that It would be impossible to ever say. See, Paul said things unspeakable, and I understand. You, you can't. There isn't any, isn't any way that it can be said. But this sea of glass speaks of a transparency in our lives, the dealings, that I become so transparent that the Lord can be seen through my life, clearly seen, because I become transparent. I, I remember John Follett saying one time, talking to, to a minister that was quite arrogant, and the man says to him, he says, this is my convert. And John Follett said, it's very obvious. <laughs> he, he, he was an iconoclast. He was sort of an, that's an idol breaker. And uh, he, he, he had a tendency to do things like that. But you see, that sea of glass means that my life has become so one with the Lord. See, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Transparent. That the life of the Lord is seen through my life. And I fade into, see, I'm crucified, I'm dead. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. That becomes experiential. That sea of glass. Where, where anything of self that's a hindrance and we have to hold this before the Lord to become a part of this that it could be dealt see this is this is the message of the kingdom our relationship to the throne becoming available becoming that corporate womb becoming a part of that sea of glass that's before the throne transparent that the Lord's going to reveal himself to this world through the church He's going to reveal himself to a people that have become transparent. They had six wings. You have to save that. Three sets of wings. Covered their face because he's the head. They covered their feet because we're to walk in the spirit and then, then we're ready to move in the spirit. That's where the wheel within the wheel begins to function. And they were full of eyes within without. If you've read the book of Revelation, you've read where, where those in the world are going to cry for the rocks to fall on them, to hide them. I'll tell you why. Because the Lord told me. The Lord is going to impart such a discernment, a word of discernment, a knowing. See, eyes within and without. That's discernment. Spiritual discernment with authority. That's apostolic anointing that's moving into the body. Not apostles, but apostolic anointing in every level of life. If, I'm call, if, if I mop floors or wash dishes, I can mop floors and wash dishes with apostolic anointing and authority. And I can touch people things that I couldn't touch in any other way or place. Eyes within, without. A word with authority, so much so that, the, that, that this world is going to be so judged, drug traffic, the things that plague crime, it's going to be exposed and dealt with in judgment, so much so that, the, that the, this world is going to cry for the rocks to hide them, because the church is going to be, the world's going to tremble before the church. Not vindictively through those that like bullies, but through those that have, have, have the face of a lion the authority, but also the brokenness and the yieldedness and compassion of a lamb. See, that calf, that helpless calf. And the Lord's preparing a witness in this day. And there's a working, a profound working of the Lord within those that are willing to make themselves available to submit. And simply, like Mary of old, the angel Gabriel came. And she said, I don't understand. It's totally impossible. But I'm what? I'm willing. Just that's all. That's all the Lord's asking. I want to be a part, Lord, of that which you're about to birth into the earth in this day. The message of the kingdom. 
a people prepared that the Lord's going to use to bring judgment to this world. Hallelujah. Amen. By the grace of God, Pinecrest has a unique calling to become for the preparation of that people, to become as the sea of glass, the, not because of rules and all that, but because of something within our lives, our hearts are seeking to become that people. To be set apart as unto the Lord of primary input. See, immediately I was in the Spirit. It doesn't take a whole song service, you know, to get us lined up. Amen. Okay, let's all stand. I'm going to pray and then Richard Ford. Father, I thank you for that which you're speaking. Somehow, Lord, help us to hear, to be challenged, to lift our vision higher. Certainly, Lord, the harvest fields are there. But we're living in a time of transition, and you're calling us to come higher, to be prepared. Certainly all that's included. But, Lord, even as Mary of old, said, I'm available. Even now, Lord, in our heart of hearts, Lord, we're, we're available. Yes. And Lord, Pinecrest is available. This place, available. And I'm asking, Lord, through the years that I've been here, I'm asking for a major visitation, not for people to come and be entertained, but for lives to become as that sea of glass, prepared, transformed, to hear a present word, to be prepared. I'm asking visitation, an open heaven, a mighty working of the Spirit within lives in this place for your purpose, for your glory. And I thank you, Lord. Quicken, bring forth, accomplish, Move with Bon Pinecrest. I ask, Lord, an increase in enrollment, an increase in finances, an increase in your presence, in the workings of your spirit, in the apprehending of a people for your purpose, for your glory. And Lord, I hold all this before you, asking a special blessing by Dr. Ronald Taylor and all those that relate that are under him in Pinecrest, a special blessing on the leadership of Pinecrest. Your approbation, your favor flowing down, Lord. In every office, Dr. Ford is the dean, the teachers, all those in places of responsibility, the staff, the students, a mighty moving, Lord, of your grace within and upon this place. A witness in the earth in this day of a people committed, set apart, sanctified. And I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Glory. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Dr. Ford.